subscribe our channel and press the bell icon for watching more video. So in this section, all along we have been learning about returns. So we have talked about two different kinds of returns. Standard returns, which are called return delivery. And there is another type of return called return PO. And we know how to create either of these. Now, after we return goods, say with Amazon, we get a credit, right? We either get a money or we get a credit note. A credit note is as good as money because we can buy goods with a credit note. Now, this is all good. We return goods, we get money. But what happens if there is an issue in pricing that purchase order? Meaning, say the price of a purchase order is dollar thousand, hundred kilos of coffee at ten dollars per kilo. Then you receive the goods for a quantity of hundred, and then you do an invoice receipt for say thousand dollars at at ten dollars per kilo this is all good but later what we have realized is maybe the vendor has overcharged us or the vendor could have also undercharged us the price should have been say eleven dollars instead of ten dollars what do you do now so the price we have found out is not ten dollars but it's eleven dollars in which case the vendor has undercharged us by a dollar. So we need to give the vendor how much? So at a rate of $11, this is going to be 1100 right? So we need to return $100 to the vendor. This is case of undercharging. And in case of overcharging, say it should have been $9, but the vendor has charged us $10. In which case, we have paid the vendor $1,000, but we should only have paid 900 and we should have received or we should receive a credit of $100. So, in case of overcharging, the vendor overcharging us, we receive a credit. In case of undercharging, we receive a debit note. A debit note is a notice to pay more. A credit note says, hey, you know what, I need to pay you. Right? It's pretty logical. If the vendor overcharges you, you get a credit. If vendor undercharges you, you have to pay the money back. So again, let's start here. We'll create a PO. We'll do a goods receipt, we'll do an invoice receipt real quick and then we'll do either of these scenarios. First, we'll do the undercharge and then we'll do the overcharge. So real quick, let's create the purchase order for a quantity of 100. Right Now we have become experts in creating purchase orders, returns and invoices. Right. So at a price of $10, save. Pick up the PO. My go, goods movement. Enter the purchase order number. We're going to receive it into our coffee storage location. Item OK and quantity of 100. Save. Enter an invoice. Put today's date in there. Enter the PO number and select invoice over here. So this is important. If you select a credit memo, you won't get the right amounts. And the amount is $1,000. Everything cool. Save it. So we have created this, right? So it doesn't take long, really. It takes like, you know, three minutes to do these steps. Now we're going to create. So we'll do this scenario now where the vendor has undercharged us. So instead of 11, which is the right price, he has charged us $10. So 
So we need to give back hundred dollars. So how do you do that? So we know the PO number. Go to Miro, and instead of invoice or credit memo, select subsequent debit. All right. Put today's date in there, and enter the PO number. So the quantity is hundred, and the amount is hundred. Okay, we are giving back hundred dollars to the vendor. When you give back to the vendor, it's called a debit memo. When you get money from the vendor, it's called a credit memo, right? So subsequent debit is something that you do when there is no logistics involved. Here there is no logistics, right? We are not returning the goods. We are not taking in the goods. It's a pure financial transaction. Now you might have a question: Why do we select a quantity of hundred? Because we are not doing a logistics transaction, right? So why do we select hundred? Well, that hundred is used for tracking. So somewhere down the line, if somebody wants to know the, what is the amount that you are giving this credit for, just by looking at the debit memo, people will know that this is the quantity against which we are giving. A debit of hundred dollars, right? So quantity ties things together, and that's why we have a quantity there. Although there is no logistics, the truck does not come pick up the goods. Nothing like that. It's a pure financial transaction, but we still have the quantity there to tie things together from an accounting perspective. All right, so save it, and that's it. Now, all debit memos are typically blocked for payment. That's how SAP configures it by default. You can go release that document by double-clicking it. Go back. Go to Logistics, Material Management, Logistics Invoice Verification, Further Processing, and Released Blocked Invoice. Put your invoice number in there. Hit execute and select it, and click release. And don't forget to save it. This document is released because we have to give money back to the vendor, right? Just so that nobody misuses it. By default, those kind of documents go on a block. This just ensures that there is a little bit of oversight in terms of giving money back to the vendor, right? Now we can also create a credit note. It's called as a subsequent credit instead of a subsequent debit. So it's a case of we undercharging the vendor. So the vendor says, "Hey, you know what? The price is not ten dollars; it's nine dollars. I've accidentally charged you ten dollars. So I'm going to give you back a credit of hundred dollars. We are very happy to take it, right?" The way to take it is with a subsequent credit. Put your PO number in there. The quantity of hundred comes up, and how much does the vendor needs to give us back? A quantity of hundred. So put that in the amount here, and click save. That's it. Now, if you go back to the purchase order and, as usual, to the purchase order history. You'll see all these transactions tied together to that purchase order. First, there was a goods receipt of hundred. So we've asked for a hundred kilos of coffee, and that has been delivered. And then the vendor sent us an invoice for hundred. So thousand dollars is being paid to the vendor. And after that, we have realized that the vendor has undercharged us. So we created what's called as a subsequent debit. So you can just click on this document if you want to see the corresponding debits and credits. This is a credit for hundred dollars, and this is a debit for hundred dollars. Debit is marked as an invoice, and a credit is marked as a credit memo. And these are all subsequent debits and credits logged. So we got the goods receipt log here, we got the invoice receipt log here, and then we got the logs for subsequent credits and debits.
So that's how you do subsequent credits. So this is called a subsequent debit. Debit is where we need to pay the vendor. And this is subsequent credit. Credit is where the vendor needs to pay us. Now, this has nothing to do with returns. Remember, you also get a credit memo when you do returns. Right? But this is not a return. There is no logistics involved. There is no goods movement involved. It's a pure financial transaction where this credit memo is got because the vendor has overcharged us. Right? We have got this debit memo from the vendor because the vendor has undercharged us. Now, let's, let's summarize all the subsequent transactions that we have done with respect to the original P2P transactions. So, what have we done? We started with a PO, right? And that was for a quantity of 100, right? And the amount is 1000, 100 into 10, right? And then we have created a goods receipt again for a quantity of 100. And the amount is 1000 invoice receipt for a quantity of 100 amount thousand dollars so this is the primary p2p transaction right now after that we have done a number of steps the first step is one of the steps is we could create a return delivery so with respect to the goods receipt we could do a return delivery, right? And we could also create a credit memo. So you do this step when you want to do returns, right? When you want to do returns, you do a return delivery and do a credit memo. Now, if the vendor has overcharged us, then what do we do? then we, we don't have returns, we don't have any goods movement. What we do is, against this PO, we just create an invoice receipt that's called as a subsequent credit, which is the case where the vendor is paying us money because he has overcharged it. All right, now what if the vendor has undercharged us? In which case, so we need to pay the vendor. In that case, instead of creating a subsequent credit, you create a subsequent debit. Right? So we have covered subsequent credits, subsequent debits and returns. Now, another type of returns that we have covered is called a return PO. Return PO. What's a return PO? A return PO is a PO. You don't need to reference anything like the newspaper's transaction. At the end of the week, we are going to create a new PO. And the difference here is we are going to mark that item at the line item level as a return item and we try to do a goods receipt it doesn't do a goods receipt instead does a goods issue so if the quantity is for 100 we're going to return a quantity of 100 and you're not going to create a standard invoice instead you're going to create a credit memo so we receive amount for that 100 quantity so we have talked about four subsequent cycles to the standard P2P cycle. So this is the standard P2P cycle. Right? This is called returns. This is called returns PO. This is subsequent credit or credit memo and this is subsequent debit. Right? So to the standard P2P cycle we have created four different subsequent steps. Returns, returns PO, subsequent credit, subsequent debit. 
this concludes the returns chapter so in the returns chapter we have also seen not just returns but credits and debit members